Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the game for two or more players, Code Names, by Czech Games Edition. Can the spy masters communicate in code effectively to their teammates to help them identify their agents in the field before the other team does? They're going to have to use some clever word clues to do this, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. There are 400 different code names on the 200 double-sided code name cards. You're going to want to shuffle and then choose randomly 25 of these. The rest you can return to the box. The 25 you chose you'll place in a 5x5 five five grid like you see here. There are rules included for two and three player games, but for a standard game like we're going to teach here, you need at least four players. Two per team. One member of each team will be the spy master of that team. Opposing spy masters will sit side by side on this side of the table, and their teammates will sit on the opposite side of the table, each in a group across from their spy master. You'll notice the words are printed in both directions so that all players can read them easily regardless of where they're sitting. If you have more than four players, try to divide the teams up as evenly as possible based on the number of players and their skill level. For example, if you had seven players and the blue spy master was sitting here, you might assign three of the players to join their team and then the remaining two players would join the red spy master seated here. Now shuffle these key cards into a face down pile and have the spy masters draw a single one and place it into the stand in any random orientation, ensuring that their teammates across the table can't see it. The remaining deck can be returned to the box. This key is a five by five grid just like the code names that we laid on the table, and so it identifies to both spy masters the identities of the code named agents on the table. Blue squares represent the agent words that the blue team must guess. Red squares are the agent words for the red team. Pale squares are innocent bystanders, and the single black square is the assassin. The color, red or blue, in lights around the outside edge of the key indicates the team that will be going first, in this case, the blue team. The first team will always have nine agents, so you see nine blue squares on this key. The other team will always have eight. The other team, in this case red, will have eight. Looking at this key in the bottom left hand corner, we see two blue squares, so the two spy masters know that the cards in the same locations, wake and needle, are code names for agents of the blue team. And the red space here means that tablet is a code name for one of the red team's hidden agents. The eight blue agent tiles should be put in a stack in front of the blue spy master. And the eight red agents should go in front of the red spy master. Now the team going first will find and flip the double agent to their color and put it into their stack. Now each spy master has a number of agent cards equal to the number of words they're trying to help their teammates find. Also place the seven bystanders and single assassin nearby as well. And that's the setup. Through the use of word clues, the two spy masters will take turns trying to help their teammates identify their fellow agents hidden amongst the code names on the table. The more daring the clue, the more agents that the team might be able to find in a single turn, but the more risks that they'll face. Identify all of your team's agents first, and you win. The first team starts the game, and on a team's turn, their spy master should look at all of the agent words on the grid that they know are theirs, again, based on the key they have in front of them and then they try to think of a single word that relates to the meaning of some of those agents. They say that word out loud along with a number. The number represents the number of their agent names on the grid that they believe relates to the clue they are giving. Now you could give a clue related to just one word on the grid, but that's not nearly as fun. And remember, the game is a race to help your team identify all of their agents first. So the more you can identify, the better. And honestly, it's more impressive. The clue must be one word, and it can't be any of the ones already on the table. For example, I couldn't have given space as a clue in this situation. However, as the game goes on, some of the words will get covered up, and once they're no longer visible, you could then use them as a clue. You also shouldn't lead your team by saying things like, well, this clue is really out there, but just say the clue, say the number, and leave the rest to your team. Now a little later we will talk about some of the other rules about what kind of clues you can and can't give, but let's move on for a moment. Once the team has received the clue, they now set about trying to figure out what does it mean, and they can discuss, talk openly, and debate it. 
but the spy master should give no visual reactions. When the team is ready to make a guess, one member touches the first card they wish to choose. If they pick a card belonging to their team, even if it wasn't the agent the spy master intended them to guess, maybe the team thought the space clue meant space needle and they touched that instead. Well, as long as the code name relates to an agent of that team, you're fine. And the spy master covers the word with an agent card of their color. Then the team can guess another word. But what happens instead if the team touches one of the other agent's cards? Well, you've just helped your opponents get ahead because that team gets to drop one of their agent tiles there instead. It also means the turn is over. No more guessing. If a team touches an innocent bystander, well, you cover it with one of those tiles and the turn also immediately ends. And worst case scenario, if a team member touches the space where the assassin is located, the word is covered by the assassin card and the game immediately ends and the team that touched the assassin loses and the other team automatically wins. In other words, be careful not to give a clue that might lead your team to accidentally choose the assassin. As long as a team is guessing successfully, they can continue to touch other code names and make a total number of guesses up to the number said by the spy master plus one. In other words, you can always guess one additional word beyond what the spy master intended you to. This is helpful because as turns go on, a team may realize what a spy master had intended with a previous clue. And then with this bonus guess, a team can take advantage of the new assumption. For example, on this turn, maybe the blue spy master said wood two, and the team correctly guessed table and block, and then realized, wait a second, the spy master had said space earlier and moon sitting right here. The team may now guess this in an attempt to catch up or get ahead of the opposing team. And sometimes, in a desperate attempt to win, you might just risk a wild guess. Also, even if a team would be allowed to guess further, they can always stop guessing at any time. And you might do this if you're just not entirely confident what the spy master is intending with their clue and you don't want to risk making a mistake. However, a team must always make at least one guess every turn. Once a turn is over, then the other team takes their turn. And so it continues until one team has all of their words covered, in which case they win, even if it's a result of the losing team accidentally picking the winning team's last word. And as mentioned, picking the assassin ends the game as well. In a game like this, it does help to have some guidelines about appropriate behavior. For example, a team should not be staring intently at the eyes of the spy master as they're scanning the grid trying to think up clues to give. Likewise, the spy master shouldn't give visual reactions. If a team guesses a word, the spy master shouldn't go, well, that's right, but not what I intended. Just cover it up and move on. When it comes to clues, they must be about the meaning of the word. And you can't give a clue that helps spell the word you're trying to get them to guess. For example, I couldn't say table as the clue if I was trying to get my team to guess tablet. But letters and numbers can be used as long as they relate to the meaning of the words. For example, I could say eight as my clue and three as my number. If the three words I was trying to get my team to guess were ball, as in an eight ball, octopus, which has eight legs, and figure, like a figure eight. But the number of guesses can't be used as a clue itself. For example, if I was to say citrus as the clue and eight as the number, I couldn't do that in an attempt to get them to guess lemon for citrus and octopus for the number eight. That would be invalid. The rulebook also provides some other examples of valid and invalid clues. So in the rare event of a dispute during a game, I'd suggest that you look there. That said, if an invalid clue is given, that team's turn ends immediately and the other team's spy master may freely cover up any one of their own words before giving their next clue. Although you're not required to use it, some players may like having the included sand timer when they feel players are taking too long, flipping it over to encourage them not to debate endlessly over the meaning of a clue. And that's how you play code names. The rules also provide instructions for two and three player games if you want to play cooperatively, and you can also do that in larger groups. Basically, it provides you a way to score your performance so you can try to do better each time you play. But I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. If you have any questions about the standard game, 
feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching. <laughs>